and welcome to the fourth installment of the Wharton Global High School Investment Competition Meet the Experts series. I'm Eli Lesser, Executive Director of the Wharton Global Youth Program, and I'll be with you today to kind of host and ask questions, field your questions that you're going to submit for our great guests um, with us today. Before we jump in talking to our guests today, I just want to remind you that the mission of the Wharton Global Youth Program, of which the Global High School Investment Competition is part, is really to mobilize all of the opportunities that we offer at the Wharton School to um, connect and educate and inform and inspire pre-collegiate students like yourself, um, to explore business practices, analyze the world's complex challenges, and take the steps you need to become leaders who will transform our global economy. We really see you as the future of business, and we hope you'll engage with us and start that thought process and start training with us right away. So in addition to our investment competition, how can you get involved with us? Well, we offer summer programs, academic year programs, as well as an online business journal for high school students and I really want to encourage you to check out all that the Global Youth Program has to offer. You can check out our website by Googling Wharton Global Youth, um, search for it on your favorite search engine, or just go to globalyouth.wharton.upenn.edu, and you'll see all those opportunities and find out how to get involved. I want to take a moment to welcome all of you who are connecting to us from around the world. Do us a favor if you've joined us before in previous ones. This is a tradition we have. If not, you'll learn all about it. Please do us a favor in the chat window right now. Um, punch in your city, state, country, and school, or one of that combination of those two, so we can see where everyone's connecting from. We'd love to see where everyone's coming from in the chat um, right now, so punch in, let's see where you're coming from. All right, as those come in, let's really jump in. It's great to see so many people tuning in from around the world. So we're excited to see our competitors with, um, we're excited to support our competitors with new learning opportunities. Meet the Experts, the program we're doing today is a weekly live interview that we started just this academic year, and it's a chance for you to meet industry experts and Morton faculty exploring different competition related topics. All of our interviews are recorded and available to you on our competition websites. So in case you missed it or you have a fellow teammate or a friend or teacher who you want to tell about this great program, feel free to check out the competition website and watch recorded lectures. Um, from the past. Our next Meet the Experts series, so start marking your calendar now. Um, our webinar will be hold, held next Wednesday, October 28th, and we'll be talking to Sid Muraladar, who is the captain of the 2008 Global Champion. So if you're competing this year and you're about to submit that mid-project report, it's a great chance to hear from Sid, who won the competition back in 2018. He's going to get some great guidance. He's now a, an undergraduate student um, at Virginia Tech. Sid will uh, discuss all about competition life and also how it impacted his work after high school. So how do we do this? I'm going to talk a little bit to our panelists in a minute, um, but I also want to encourage you to post questions in the Q&A panel. Please use the Q&A panel, not the chat. The chat goes kind of quick for us. So use the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen to send those questions in. I'm going to ask a few questions of our, of our guests, and then we'll jump in with questions from you. This program is for you as students, so I encourage you to make your voice heard and share those questions at any point, and we will get to those later in the later in the conversation. All right, enough introduction. Let's talk about our guest. Today our guest is joining us from BTG Pactual, the largest investment bank in South America, and it's based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I would like to take this moment to also recognize BTG and thank them as a sponsor of the investment competition. Really, we couldn't do the work that we do putting on the competition, having these conversations without the very generous support of BTG Pactual. So thank you to BTG Pactual for all of your support of the investment competition. On behalf of the whole Wharton Global Youth Program, I really want to say thank you. So from BTG, we're excited to welcome William Landers, who's the managing partner and head of, who's a managing partner and also head of Latin American equities, um, BTG Pactual's asset management group. Um, and he's unfortunately not in Latin America. He's actually talking to us today from his home in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Will before we jump in. Um, prior to joining BTG Pactual in March 2019, Mr. Lander spent 17 years as head of Latin American equities at BlackRock, where he was also a member of the firm's global emerging markets team and member of its investment stewardship committee. Um, previously, he worked for seven years as a sell-side equity analyst at CSFB and Lehman Brothers, covering the Latin American technology and food and beverage sectors, respectively. Lander started his career in 1991 in the Latin American Investment Banking Division at Bear Stearns. He holds a bachelor's degree in finance and international management from Georgetown University and is a CFA charter holder. Will, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you. Thanks, guys. Great to be here with you. 
So let's start with your current work. Tell us a little bit about your role at BTG Pactual as a managing partner and head of Latin American equities. Yeah, so BTG is a partnership. Uh, we have 84 managing partners uh, around the world, most of them in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, in Rio, but also uh, a few here in New York, a few in London. Uh, and we're, as you mentioned, we're the largest independent investment bank, uh, focusing mostly on Latin America. Uh, so as, as head of Latin American division within the asset management business, I'm responsible for our equity investments uh, throughout the region. So we have Latin American funds that I personally manage uh, out of New York. Uh, and then we also have local funds in Brazil, in Mexico, in Chile, in Colombia, uh, where we have local teams managing those funds. And those analysts also work with me to do the stock picking for the Latin American funds. So overall, we have 28 investment professionals throughout the Americas. Uh, we even have three people in New York uh, that look at U.S. consumer and tech stocks uh, because we find that those are very interesting, give us a lot of interesting trends uh, that eventually will hit or are already in the, in the stages of hitting uh, the markets in Latin America. So before joining BTG, you were head of Latin American equities at BlackRock, a member of their global emerging markets team. Tell us a little bit about your role and maybe contrast that role a little bit with what you're doing right now um, with BTG. So BlackRock, for those of you who don't know it, is the largest asset manager in the world. Uh, it manages something, I forget about the last number, but it's something between six and seven trillion dollars of investments. Think about that, it's bigger than most economies in the world. Uh, so it's a huge organization, uh, which was started with, in 1988, so it's fairly new. Uh, and I was part of one of the companies that was acquired. So Merrill Lynch uh, sold uh, its investment manager and division, its asset manager to BlackRock in 2006. This is why I'm in Princeton. I was part of that team based here in Princeton, and, and then we were uh, acquired by BlackRock even before the crisis of 08. So it was, it was uh, kind of, it was one of these things where BlackRock was making, Merrill Lynch was making a decision that they wanted to be out of that part of the business. And, and, and we were happy to be part of BlackRock and being solely focused on asset management. So there I, I was responsible for building a Latin American business. So I joined in 2002. Uh, when pretty much nobody wanted to invest in Latin America. We had very few assets in place. Uh, I would join as an analyst. Uh, the portfolio manager left three months later, and I was basically told, hey, why don't you go ahead and take care of that, business, that, that fund for now, because we're probably going to shut it down in the, in the next uh, couple of quarters. And I was like, oh, great. Uh, but luckily, things worked out well. Uh, Latin America market became an interesting market for investors, uh, and we were able to grow a nice business there. And then with BlackRock, then, we be, it, we. we um, we're part of this organization that was so focused was to manage uh, people's money. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the, this fiduciary duty that you assume as an asset manager where you're responsible for somebody's um, portfolio. And if you think about it, it's, you know, it's your college money, it's your parents' retirement money, it's, you know, it is what it is, it's the money to buy a vacation home for a trip or whatever it is. It's a huge responsibility. And I think uh, uh, through my years at BlackRock, I learned uh, very much how to do that. Uh, and how to keep that focus that it's 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 somebody else's money and you better take care of it as if it was your own. And there, I, mean, I think the, the big difference was that I was part of the emerging markets team, not only the Latin American team. So uh, I had a team of five folks uh, focusing on Latin America. So that's a big difference between now and uh, and then there was five people then. Uh, and today we have 20 people who are looking at Latin America. Um, we were part of a global emerging markets team. So we, uh, I was involved with people in London who were managing uh, money for Eastern Europe and for frontier markets, and more and more with, with, with our team in Hong Kong uh, that was managing uh, the, our, our Asian portfolios and eventually the global emerging markets portfolios were managed out of Hong Kong. So learning how to deal with uh, video calls and, and dealing with people in different time zones um, was something that was already natural for us uh, and for me and for the two colleagues that joined with me, uh, BTG, even before this whole uh, COVID crisis, which forced us to do things like this, which is to talk on Zooms and, and Blue Jeans and all the kinds of uh, teams and whatever it is. Uh, that's pretty much what I do all day. Uh, it, it's talk to people uh, from my team in different countries, talk to companies, talk to management. Um, so uh, so it was good training for that. Uh, but also it helped me to, to uh, realize that uh, emerging markets, while it's one term, it's very different when you, where you're looking at something in China versus India versus Indonesia versus Russia versus Brazil and Chile. So uh, I think that was a great perspective as well. So, you know, lots there to unpack. And I want to spend a, a couple seconds, a couple minutes, I should say, on what you were talking about, the work that you do, you know, with our with these remarkable students who are putting together their own investment teams. A lot of words flying around, right, from the investment world. So can you do me a favor and define global emerging market? 
what is a global emerging market? We hear this a lot, whether we're watching Bloomberg or CNBC, you know, and you just mentioned it a lot, and it's in your work. Yeah, so generally speaking, when you're talking about the developed world, uh, which is kind of a, uh, almost has a negative connotation, right, because it means that we're underdeveloped. And, and the emerging markets used to be called developing, used to be called underdeveloped. Uh, it went through a bunch of different phases of how, what was the right term. Uh, and emerging sounds sounds nice. Hey, it's emerging. It's and eventually going to become one of us, uh, which I guess is an aspiration. Uh, although I'm not sure that's that's exactly true. Uh, but emerging markets are countries where you have a lower GDP per capita. Generally, that's how they divide up uh, the country, uh, and somewhat and other types of uh, instabilities that that can hit the place uh, from time to time. But it's mostly related to the purchasing power of the population. Uh, so when we're talking about the Americas, is anything from Mexico down? It's emerging. It's, it's Latin America. It's 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 all all, all of Latin America. It's in the emerging markets. Uh, Af Africa is it's really more of a um, frontier market. It's not it's not in any of the uh, traditional emerging markets yet. So they're either less developed in terms of the equity capital markets uh, or the purchasing power of the people. And I think in Africa's case is both. Um, when you look at Europe, uh, pretty much most of Eastern Europe, uh, including Russia, uh, Turkey. Now Greece, Greece used to be an emerging market, was upgraded uh, to develop more status, and then after they went through the crisis in 08, they went back to being an emerging market. Uh, so that's the European emerging markets. Uh, the Middle East is also more in the frontier area than an emerging market. And then in Asia, uh, everybody but Japan uh, is considered an emerging market. So let's stay with this question. I mean, you're saying, you know, GDP, understanding the geographies of all these places, the connection they make, you know, yourself, you know, in the bio that I share with the students, um, we talked about how you have a double degree from Georgetown. And Georgetown is known as, as a great international education school, all the great stuff you learn there. And you have um, you have a bachelor's degree in both finance and international management. You know, when we think about Wharton or business education, I think in many ways, sometimes students think just about the business. But you know, you're clearly, as you're speaking, you know so much about what's going on, countries and political, economic and social environment where you choose to invest. How do you stay up to speed on that? And also, as a follow-up question, but mainly also the bulk of it is if a student's looking to get into this work, into global investing or investing in general, what else do they need to study besides the, the math of investing? Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the big things today, uh, and, I, and I, was, I was at a meeting for the Georgetown Investment Alliance uh, two years ago when a colleague of mine was being honored, uh, and I got a chance to speak to the, um, uh, the head of Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Uh, and what I told the dean was like, the one thing that I wish I had done at Georgetown was to take more courses on political science. Because at the end of the day, uh, I was very, I am, I think, well-trained in how to value companies to do all the financing, understand accounting, uh, understand the management part of it, so the international management, understand the differences between the countries. But more and more, the politics of each of the countries is so important, uh, you know, what we call the top down, you know, what I was describing before, which is analyzing companies, it's the bottom up when you're actually dividing, a, doing a model and trying to come up with how much is this company, do I think this company is worth? What's the market pricing? Where are the opportunities? Uh, but when you think about emerging markets, when you think about Brazil, for example, the Brazilian stock market uh, has more or less followed the S&P all the way down in March and then all the way and, and then recovered in a V-shape uh, uh, in, in, the, in the following months. But in dollar terms, that, that's not apparent at all because the currency has devalued almost 30 percent, uh, having devalued almost 60 percent in March. It recovered some, but it's still one of the weakest currencies in the world. So when, if you're a dollar investor, which most of us are, Brazil still looks um, like a horrible investment this year. You know, my fund is down 28% here to date, and I'm one of the top performing funds uh, for the year. I'm not proud of that. Nobody's proud of losing a third of your client's money, even if the market lost a third plus another three or four uh, percent. But but that's what that's the kind of thing. So uh, I told the dean that I wish I had a political science background as well as my finance background. And he said, well, funny you should say that because for the first time in Georgetown's history, they're going to come up with a double degree between the school, the school of Business and the School of Foreign Services, which is you were never able to be able to do that before. So I'd say that even for those kids who are going to Wharton, uh, I'll take opportunity to take courses outside of Wharton, the Wharton School of Business uh, to get the more well-rounded. Maybe get a minor in government. Uh, if you're not a, if you're like Georgetown up until now, you couldn't get a major, get a minor in political science and some type of uh, strategic type of thing that I think is going to help you become a much better investor. So I want to come back to Brazil because I have some questions specifically about Brazil because I'm fascinated by it. But I want to stay right where we are in the Mid-Atlantic in the United States for a second. 
So as an example of that, of your understanding of government and the impact it has, so where you sit right now, and this is a question a lot of our students are asking because they're investing, they're competing right now, is what will the impact of the U.S. elections have on non-U.S. markets? What do you think, think about that? I mean, that we're, yeah. Yeah. No, I think the biggest thing that we're trying to figure out is will a, what looks like a Biden victory, right? I think if you look at the odds right now, it looks like uh, Vice President Biden will be the next president. Um, and likely with a sweep, so having the control of the Democrat, uh, of the Senate as well. Will this Democratic sweep then mean that we're even going to go into a bigger spending period? Uh, will fiscal responsibility, which hasn't been really apparent during the Trump administration, uh, become even more of an issue? And will that then lead to dollar weakness? So a minute ago, I was talking about how the Brazilian real has been very weak versus the US dollar. Will that reverse? If that reverses, that could be a positive uh, for a lot of these countries. They'll become more competitive um, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, there, there's a fine line because these countries want to have a weak enough currency where they can export cheaply. They can be competitive and competing for, you know, if I'm going to set up a, a, a factory somewhere, do I want to go to Mexico? Do I want to go to China? Do, where do I want to go? Currency and, and the labor costs is, is a big part of that. But I think that's going to be the biggest impact is if we go, we've been through this last decade, a period of dollar strength versus most currencies in the world. Uh, if a democratic sweep puts into question uh, the fiscal accounts of the United States and causes the dollar to start to weaken uh, in this world where interest rates are low and they have to stay low because we're still trying to recover from this this pandemic, uh, I think that's going to be the big impact on, on global markets. It's actually be a positive for a lot of these markets that have suffered from competing uh, with uh, with a strong dollar. Having said that, when we look at what's actually working in the stock market, uh, which is mostly the, the tech stocks, uh, they already have global presence. Uh, they, 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 um, the U.S. is obviously a very important market for them, uh, but they already have operations in a lot of these different, different countries. They've benefited uh, dollar, weaker currencies in other countries and using that, that, that cost base. Um, so it, it, it's a lot of moving parts there. That's why, that's why I think that not only studying finance, but studying something international, something in politics uh, makes a lot of sense. I always joke when reporters ask me, well, you know, about the system, like, I, I wish I was a political scientist. And, and I think the, the more I look at it, the less I understand it, because they, they seem to be in a different world when they're making those types of political decisions for things that have a very big impact on people's lives. That's excellent. Now, I'm seeing some great questions coming from our students, which I want to get to in a little bit. But I, I want to kind of dial back over towards the investing side and start asking you some more broad questions about, you know, how when we look at our global lens, right, when we look across this, and what do you really see some global trends are in investing? What are the global trends that you're observing that our students should pay attention to? Well, one that, that's, um, as, as an active investor, as an investor who believes that my team can do a better job than a computer, but a better job than an index in providing uh, um, our investors with, 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 a, with a good outcome in the portfolio, one, one thing that you can't, you can't uh, ignore is the fact that ETFs have become a big part of the market. So when you look at the U.S., it's something like 35, 40%. Uh, Europe is in the 20s. Brazil is only 5%, um, but it is growing. it's going to grow as well. And when we talk about Brazil, we can talk about that. But that's one trend where index investing, passive investing, has become a big part of the market. It gives access to a lot of investors with, with efficient products, which are cheap. Uh, and in a market that was like the U.S. was in the last decade, which was kind of going like this for, for most of it, the alpha generation from active management didn't really make that much of a difference uh, if you were able to stick with an S&P 500 that, that has had the returns that it's had over the last decade. So that's one thing to keep in mind, which is disappointing if you're an active investor. But I think the good news is that in a market where there's more volatility, where, you know, where there isn't just a straight line going up, that's when uh, your skills as an investor can come into play and, and, and provide investors with with an attractive opportunity. Obviously, uh, the, the usage of technology, uh, whether it's uh, web scraping or other way, ways of using artificial intelligence is something that we're all trying to figure out how to do. Uh, it was a big project for us uh, when I was at BlackRock, I'm sure it still is. Uh, and it's one where not a lot of people have figured out exactly how to do it. Uh, but I think that the, especially when you're looking at a large investable universe, so a global fund, a global emerging markets fund, a U.S. small cap fund, uh, having some type of quantumental analysis to go along with your, so quantitative analysis to go along with your fundamentals, so what we call quantumental 
Uh, I think it's something that's going to, it's, it's almost a necessity. Uh, so you can decide which areas of the market you're going to focus on and then use your experience as an investor to try uh, to pick the right stocks. So I think that's definitely something that, that's become very uh, apparent. Uh, and lastly, I think what we saw during this last uh, uh, nine months or so is that the large companies uh, that had the share of mind with clients uh, and had the ability to move quickly to adapt to a new environment are the ones who are the winners. Uh, so, you know, we, we were already, uh, the UPS guy already comes to our house daily with the deliveries from whatever we're doing from e-commerce, but in a lot of places in the world that wasn't the case, uh, and they were forced to do that. And I think the companies that were able to quickly, who had already some, some type of structure in place and they were able to quickly adapt, uh, I think that they were done well. BTG Pac-12, we were uh, at the height, we were 93% of our, of our colleagues were working from home. This is a trading bank. You know, it's a place where there's a lot of regulation. You can't just uh, do it, everything from home. But now I have my three screens here in my house. I haven't really been to the office in a couple of days. Uh, from Princeton to New York is a long commute. So uh, as long as I continue to be productive, uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but there are certain, certain jobs, I think, that uh, it's a lot harder when you have to work in teams. I still believe that there's value of face-to-face -face, uh, meetings and instead of just on video. I think video is, is, is very, very good, but I, think, I hope that we're going to go back to some type of medium uh, so sometime in the future. So I think, you know, the other thing our students are doing is they're putting together a portfolio to kind of pitch and, and write their reports for us is thinking about, you know, investing globally and how that addresses risk, a risk profile in their portfolio. What what does the what's the advantages of investing globally, of putting global stocks in your portfolio away from just the big blue chips in the US on the big markets? What can that add and address when it comes to risk? Well, I think it, diversification is always the, the most important thing when you're talking about risk management, right? So uh, having a well-diversified portfolio is something that uh, we're always telling our clients that's what they, they should be focusing on. Uh, and I think um, the problem is that when you buy a large cap U.S., a uh, blue chip company in the U.S., it's already somewhat diversified. So I think to really truly get diversification, mm -hmm. you have to kind of go after the, the smaller cap stocks that have more specific areas of focus and are, and are not so diversified both in terms of their business as well as their geographies. Otherwise, uh, I always used to joke that uh, uh, U.S. investors tend to be very uh, home market biased. Uh, and for them, that they, you know, when we were at BlackRock, they, if they wanted to sell one of our U.S. funds, they would go and buy the Global Allocation Fund, which was 55% U.S. anyway. Uh, so <laughs> how much restriction were you really getting right. at that point? But it, they felt good that they were buying. And, and at one point, that was our biggest fund. I'm sure it's still a very large fund at BlackRock. Uh, but it's really not diversifying that much, right? Uh, on the other extreme, uh, you know, Chile has a very strong pension fund system, uh, and they're big users of mutual funds. Uh, they were a big client of BlackRock. They're a big client of BTG, where we have uh, a local operation. Uh, and back in the 2009, 10, 11, uh, in the middle of uh, the commodity boom, um, they were selling Chilean stocks to buy material stocks or commodity funds and to buy Latin American funds. At the end of the day, they were buying, they're selling the same thing to buy the same thing. So they weren't really diversifying, even though that's what supposedly they were doing. So I think you have to be, understand what's behind what you're buying to make sure that you're getting the diversification. Otherwise, you're just double counting uh, and then you're really not doing much to, uh, to reduce the risk of the portfolio. So as you pointed out earlier, I mean, to a certain extent, buying a big blue chip U.S. stock, you know, even a Google, right? You're, you're essentially investing globally because here's a company that's not just a U.S. company. It's a, it's a global company and there's global impacts. We talked about political, social impacts around the world and that will impact that stock. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about companies um, that are non-US companies that might invest on a US exchange or, or a US company that'd be on another exchange. Why would a company choose to list their stocks on exchanges in countries where they don't necessarily do business? So Alibaba does business in the US, it's a massive company now, but you know, its primary business is not in the US and it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Why choose to be on a be on an exchange that's not your home country? I think for simplicity more than anything else. Uh, as if they're looking to go after the retail market, the individual person, you and I want to buy a share of Alibaba for our portfolio. Uh, if you have an account with Schwab or whoever it is, it's not going to be as simple for you to buy an Alibaba share listed in Hong Kong, and you probably won't even be able to buy a share listed in Shanghai uh, using that account. But you can definitely buy Alibaba ADRs, which is what they call it, American Depository Receipts, which are listed in the New York Stock Exchange. You buy it in dollars, you got the dividends in dollars, you don't have to worry about currencies in the transaction part of things. Of course, uh, 
if you're doing the homework and doing the understanding Alibaba's business, you better be looking at their business uh, in the countries where they're operating. Now, Alibaba sells the entire world, all that, but China is, uh, of course, the, the, the biggest part of the, of the market. I mean, Alibaba, supposedly, you know, we're going to see that the holding company and, and financial, now and group, uh, is looking to, to come to the market. It's supposedly going to be a bigger uh, IPO than, than, than ever done before, uh, and it's already well subscribed. Um, initially, they're not going to have a U.S. listing, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if they come in with a U.S. listing as well. Uh, but I think in the past, it was thought that if you didn't list in the U.S., you really weren't going to be able to access a lot of investors. And this is still the biggest market in the world and the most liquid. Uh, but because more and more uh, retail investors, individual investors have become more accustomed to investing in the local markets, there, there's vibrant markets uh, going on uh, all over the world. Uh, and many companies are not going through the cost of and the dual listing and, and having the U.S. listing unless they're like really large and, and, and see the benefit from that. So on that, that question of comfort, I think that's a great word for it. And this comfort in buying that, you know, you can buy in the New York Stock Exchange. You can see all the information. The New York Stock Exchange has requirements for release and, and information. When students look, as we talked about, the advantages of putting global stocks on their portfolio, how can they become comfortable crossing borders to do their analysis? And, and what would you recommend as some best places to start to research international stocks they may not even know about to look at? Well, I think, um, again, doing some type of uh, quantitative analysis to try to come down with, you know, which sectors do you want to look at, which economies do you want to look at, uh, are there any specifics in a company that you want to – so that's one way to do it. It might be difficult if you don't have access to some, some type of database that has all that information. Um, Bloomberg uh, has a lot of information, even in the public site, that where you can get a lot of new news and 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 some financial numbers uh, on the companies. Um, there's, a, you know, I think, you know, like when you, you mentioned my my, my bio, so it kind of showed my age. But you know, back in 1991, when I started at Bear Stearns, uh, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have internet, we didn't have any any of this stuff. So um, my job at, at when I was at Georgetown during during my junior and senior year was working for a company called Federal Filings, which was on top of the SEC. And a company would file their 10Q or their 10K at the SEC, and somebody from Federal Filings would get that document, make a copy, bring it upstairs, and then people like me would put into Lotus 123, which is a predecessor to, to Excel. Yeah. Uh, and then we would send it by <laughs> modem to, to investors, and that was considered to be an advantage because otherwise you yeah. have to wait for these things to be published in the Wall Street Journal uh, for you to have access to the financial statements. So if you think about it, yeah, the information is there. You just have to know where to look for it. Uh, I think the problem you have uh, when you go into certain countries is that if a company doesn't have an ADR and does, it's not really uh, looking to sell itself to the U.S. market, you may not have access to financial statements in English. Uh, ah. So the, I can't tell you the number of companies listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange that have more than $10 billion in market cap and who have never published a word in English. It's all their financials are in Chinese and all that. So I think that is a, that is a, a disadvantage if you don't speak the local language, uh, and this is why in, in my throughout my career I've always favored having people on my team covering the specific country uh, that have, at least is able to speak the language because you can read the financial statements locally, you can interview the companies in their in in, in their native tongue, uh, and and therefore get the better the best public information available. And I think that's the the, the only way to really to do it. So let's go to Brazil, because I think this all connects together. It's a, it's, a, it's a line of questioning that I'm very interested in, in helping our students understand and think through. So as I mentioned to you before we went um, live with the students, I mentioned that in February of this past year, just before the lockdown went in place, I happened to go with Cara Dunn, our director who oversees the investment competition. We went down to BTG headquarters in Sao Paulo as a great sponsor of the competition, and we appreciate everything they do for us. Um, they hosted the regional competition for last year. So we were there in February. We saw some remarkable teams from Sao Paulo and from across Brazil and Latin America. When we went into the judges' room for the presentations, one of the things that the judges scratched their heads over were when the students were highlighting one company that they were investing in, many chose Brazilian companies. And I think exactly what you're saying about the value of the currency and, and, and the like, and, and these questions is, why they would choose that over a large cap U.S. company as their, as their highlighted company. But on the other hand, as I saw, it was one of the most common pieces of advice we give people when investing from a retail point of view as well is to invest in what you know. And if you know the company down the street, but you've never seen these other companies, they may not know it, right? I don't think Home Depot is in Brazil, right? But there's other, there's other companies. So is it a good strategy for these students to think about investing domestically? Look, I think it's... 
if, if you're looking to lose money, it's, it's a good way to lose money is to invest in something you don't understand. Uh, okay. And, 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 okay. Uh, so I, I, it doesn't have to be the country, or but I think if you don't understand the business, uh, don't buy that stock. And it's something that I do now. I mean, since sometimes, you, you know, we the Latin American investable universe right. is fairly small. Uh, so I think I know most of the publicly traded companies, at least those that trade more than a million or two a day. I've met with them at one point or another. Or, and if they're important ones, I meet with them several times in the year. Um, but if I can't understand why that business makes sense, what's their competitive advantage? Why does the company exist? Uh, there's a bank in in, um, in Panama called Bladex. It was it was it was um, founded by all the central banks of Latin America 30 years ago, 35 years ago, to serve as a trade bank to help with trade lines when currencies were hard to trade and, and there weren't lines lines of credit for companies. That's not a problem anymore. You know, JP Morgan is more than happy to land, PTG is more than happy to land to any large exporter uh, throughout the, 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 the region. So why the heck does the bank still exist? Uh, and it's still there and the stock trades, doesn't trade very much. Um, and it makes money. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been able to, to survive, but I don't understand why it still exists. I'm not going to buy that stock. Uh, and I think um, that's where you have to have a diversified team uh, with different backgrounds as well, if you're putting together an investment team, because uh, it's very different to come up with a valuation for an Alibaba than it is to come up with a valuation for a steel company, uh, you know, and 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 a, and a valuation that makes sense for Alibaba is going to make no sense for for a steel company. It's going to make no sense for a brick and mortar retailer who is moving towards e-commerce and, and all that. So I think having that kind of mentality uh, makes sense. And I'm not surprised. I mean, every country in the world has a huge home market bias, as I mentioned about the U.S. Uh, and if you're just starting now to, to do the investment analysis, why not go after a Brazilian company that you know the product, you know the company, uh, and, and you can have access to a lot more information than you, if you're trying to do a, a U.S. company? Excellent advice. So let's talk a little bit about the Brazilian, the Brazilian market at the moment, right? What do you want students team to know in our competition to understand about Brazilian companies and the climate there before making decisions to invest in Brazil? What would be your big takeaways, your top level? I mean, you talked a little bit about currency, um, but, but what, what, what's the big takeaways when we think, I mean, specifically you have unique insight into the Brazilian market. What would you want them to know? Um, well, I think, first of all, what you read in the press is not what's actually happening. So if you read, if you read the press today, you think that Brazil is burning down the Amazon. There's not a tree left in the Amazon. Uh, there is a crazy president who doesn't believe in COVID, and maybe that's, uh, that might be a little bit true. Uh, but it, it is uh, it is a country that's continental in size. It's the size of the United States out there Huge. next to Alaska. So it's so if you fly from the Amazon, which I have done to Sao Paulo, it's like a five hour flight. Uh, yeah. So it's it's a huge place with a lot of natural resources, uh, a lot of um, opportunities. Uh, Two hundred and twenty million people, so a, a very large. Um, consumer market, a potential consumer market. Uh, and I think people, when they think about Brazil, they think about, oh, this is a country that's dependent on China. It's, a, it's an exporting country, and that's all that matters. Uh, but when you look at the history of Brazil, the, the times when the, con the economy has done well or the times when the economy hasn't done well have a lot more to do with what's going on with the domestic side of the equation, uh, with inflation being under control, a growth in the middle class. Uh, we saw between 2004 and 2010 about 40 million Brazilians. So we're talking about 20% of the population becoming middle class, uh, and and then you know having access to credit, having access to a cell phone, and, and everything that goes along with it, uh, and creating then the opportunity for that. So uh, the, the Brazil is very similar to the U.S. in that only about 11 or 12% of its GDP of what they produce is actually exported. So really, the domestic economy is the most important thing. So when you look at the Ibovespa, which is the, the Dow Jones for Brazil, uh, the biggest stocks are banks. Uh, it's a beer company. Uh, you have some retailers going in there. And then you also have an oil company, an iron ore company, Petrobras and Vale. But it's not as dominated by the commodities uh, as it was during the commodity boom in, in the late 2000s. Uh, and really, when you think about Brazil, it's can this domestic economy grow? So what we're looking for for Brazil is what we're looking for here in the U.S., what we're looking for in Europe is – once a lot of the stimulus that was put into place uh, during the COVID period goes away, will these economies be able to continue to in, in this V-shaped recovery that we're seeing across the world, or are we going to have some type of falter? And that's why we're having the discussion in D.C. Uh, about the next round of stimulus. Brazil is going through the same thing. But the difference is that the United States is really the only country in the world that can continue to print money uh, almost at will, right? I mean, we had a placement of 10-year bonds today at less than 1% a year. 
it's basically free money. So, that, so we can afford to do a lot more. Uh, when you're in an emerging country like Brazil, which is already going to be getting close to 100% debt to GDP by the end of the year, uh, and you, you already have a tax rate, uh, an overall tax rate that's higher than it is in the U.S., uh, there's just so much you can do there. And I think that's what uh, that's that's one of the main reasons why the currency has been so weak, uh, because the currency has been serving as the adjuster versus global markets uh, because of this fiscal instabilities. Excellent. So um, I want to turn to the student questions. Um right now because we have some great questions coming in and we're going to start in brazil we have a great question from a student in brazil my portuguese is just horrendous so joe <laughs> from joe pedro from uh from brazil asked do you believe covid 19 will have a lasting impact on globalization and will affect the future relations between countries if so how should we change our outlook when it comes to investing so thank you to him for asking that question about COVID. i always seem to leave the COVID questions out of my prepared question but it needs to be asked well joe pedro uh that's how you pronounce it by the way thank you uh, it's uh it's an interesting question and we don't have the answer yet right i think um there are certain sectors that are definitely going to be more impacted by the, the pandemic than others uh when you think of airlines you think of hotels you think of tourism uh will we go back to the way we were before i don't know uh will global relations change uh, i think that's really coming more from a trade perspective than necessarily from this pandemic uh, i think we were already in a path where the trade war between the United States and China, which has been going on for, for a long time, uh, I don't think it's ever going to end. Uh, I think it's one where uh, if we listen to both sides of the aisle in, in D.C., uh, there wasn't that much disagreement about the need to go to be tough with the Chinese. So I don't think that a Biden presidency, if it happens, will really change that course too much. But I think it creates opportunities because what we saw during the, the last few years is that uh, the the NAFTA agreement was was redone into the USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, which is a better one, but continues to, to keep this North America trade uh, area uh, open. Uh, Brazil uh, hasn't really been a part of, of that. You know, the uh, attempts to bring NAFTA to uh, the rest of Latin America have never been successful. Uh, but I think that if we're going to end up with two supply chains, one serving China, one serving the US, uh, Brazil's already linked very much to China uh, with agricultural products, with our Nora, with commodities, low-value-added products. Uh, but why can't you, Brazil now, especially with the currency being as devalued as it is, uh, and interest rates being lower now, being more competitive, uh, become a part of this uh, supply chain working with the United States and perhaps with parts of Europe? So I think well, we're going to. I think globalization as we know it is probably going to be very. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's over, but it's going to definitely be different going forward. Uh, because uh, of of these uh, the same fighting that we see between the two largest economies in the world, uh, but at, and, and at the end of the day, that's going to create opportunities. But it, it's probably going to create a little bit of inflation as well, because uh, if you're going to have to have two different products, uh, Eli, you might remember when you had the VHS and the Beta for a tape, to watch <laughs> yeah. the video tape. I uh, do. I don't think anybody on the rest, anyone listening does. Nobody, but I do. nobody here on the call knows what, what I'm talking about. But you're going to end up with a lot of different technologies that have been developed uh, mm -hmm. in parallel. Uh, and that eventually creates a little bit more cost for the world. All right, so we have a, a question also, you know, very current right now. Um, I'm going to guess why he's asking it. So Prakar asked, uh, asked, how much of an importance should we give to lawsuits against the company? Yesterday, we saw a pretty big lawsuit brought by the U.S. government against Google. I'm going to imply that's what that's what is being suggested here, but I'm not guaranteeing it. But so what, it, you know, lawsuits against the company, a large cap company probably gets lawsuits brought against it all the time, right? Absolutely. If you look at the legal teams at these companies, they're, they're as big as the commercial teams. Uh, so I, I think that's something that's unfortunately part of, of doing business. Uh, I think this battle that you're seeing between some politicians in the U.S. and some of the largest technology companies about have they gotten too big uh, and how can we break that up? Um, I think it's the one that we're going to have for a while, especially if we have a democratic sweep in, uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's one that's worrying because uh, if you believe in, in free markets like I do, and I think a lot of uh, your Wharton students do or uh, future Wharton students do, uh, government getting too involved in business, uh, it's not something that we like to see. Uh, and I think when you look at a Google, okay, they're dominant, but there's plenty of other search engines out there. Uh, some have gone away, some have gained share, and, you know, and, uh, and it's not like they're fighting against small players, right? They're, they're dealing with Microsoft, Intel, other kinds of companies. Uh, who are trying to have a competitive product so it's 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 something that that can have a big impact um i think um 
we tend to take that for granted in the United States that uh, we're not going to have government interference in business as much. But when you go behind, I mean, there's a lot of regulation that was put in place uh, in the last uh, 12 or 13 years. Uh, I remember Rocco the president of BlackRock, um, uh, after the OA crisis, saying that the biggest risk we had was that the, the regulation swing would get too, too far to the left uh, and eventually will correct itself. But in the meantime, it can have uh, some uh, negative impacts in the valuations of companies for sure. So it's definitely something to, to keep in mind. And, you know, uh, we haven't talked yeah. about ESG. Uh, you know, environmental. Yep, we've not talked about ESG. That's right. Uh, as a topic, uh, but I think this is something that uh, you know. As I was thinking about the question about what's important in global investing, ESG is becoming uh, a necessity also uh, uh, when you analyze companies, uh, and when you look at the environmental impact that companies have, how they're acting from a social basis. You know, governance was always easy for us to see. Either the guy is doing the right things for all shareholders, or or, or the company is not, uh, and then you can penalize that company don't buy it, put in a lower valuation for it. Uh, but environmental issues have become obviously more important. Social issues have become very important during this pandemic period. Uh, and, and I was just thinking of that because obviously those lead to lawsuits, which can be uh, very harmful to, to shareholders uh, if they weren't paying attention to it. So let's go a little deeper on that, on ESG, right? So ESG and global companies. Sitting in the United States, we hear talk about it. Some, we hear about triple bottom line. Where do you see, let's let's focus specifically on Latin America, where you focus your work. Let's talk about how ESG is discussed amongst Latin American companies. It's becoming, it, it's being forced upon them by the investment community to a certain extent. Uh, yeah. but, on the other, but on the other side, uh, companies have always, uh, I think they did a lot of these things as part of their business and they just didn't call it that. Uh, so like I mentioned, governance. As an investor who's been looking, investing in these companies for for 30 years, 25 years, whatever it is, we always talk to the companies about their business, talk about their, their you know, the governance of the company. So the G part of it, I think we have pretty well mapped out. Uh, in Brazil, uh, 12 years ago or so, uh, there was a new market within the the, the, the stock market uh, called the Novo Mercado, the new market, um, which which forced companies to only have one share cl class of shares, to have independent board members, have an independent audit committee, and a few other things. Things that the New York Stock Exchange doesn't require and the NASDAQ sure doesn't require because you have all these tech companies with super voting power uh, for the for the founders or, and, and then in, investors having uh, a, not the full vote. Um, at the end of the day, we have to remember that as fund managers, we're here as fiduciaries of our clients. Um, I don't want to say we're not fiduciaries of the world, but uh, we, we our, our main objective is to provide returns to our investors. What we have seen from our work in looking at ESG is that companies that have good ESG practices or are looking to improve their ESG practices end up being the better stocks anyway. So you're not mm -hmm. leaving money on the table by investing in the higher quality companies that are focused on, on the environment and who are focused on making sure that their impact on the communities around them as well as for their work workforce uh, has changed uh, as, as good uh, and, and has the good governance where they treat all shareholders the same. And uh, I remember one uh, CEO from a Mexican company who was heard during a press conference saying, well, when you own 67% of the company, you do what you want. If you don't like it, you can sell my stock. Well, I sold the stock the next day and I never bought any of the stocks from his group of companies. And eventually they were delisted for the New York Stock Exchange. And he destroyed more value uh, by having that attitude than actually going after the, the possibilities because of all the different businesses that he had uh, to, to create more value for himself and for all his shareholders. But right, because as much, but we can't. Right, I mean, the G is the governance, right? I mean, it's right there, right? I mean, that's important. Absolutely. And people, are, people are companies. And, but we have, we can't forget the F part of it, or the financial part. Yeah, so I think that's 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 okay. the one thing when uh, when you see uh, what we call exclusionary policies, where I will not invest in the sector. Uh, you know, it was a big thing at the uh, uh, W um, the the World Bank, World Bank meetings uh, early in the year. Uh, banks being questioned, how can you be financing oil companies? You can't make a loan to an oil company anymore. Well, that's 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 interesting, right? Let's say we produce no more oil starting tomorrow. Our lights will go out, our cars, will go out. We, we just can't afford that yet. Uh, so we have to encourage these companies to be better uh, at, at their environmental impact and invest in alternative energies, invest in better filters and all that. Uh, but you have to provide that type of, uh, and not say I'm simply not going to invest in them anymore. Um, I think that's that, that you know in Brazil uh, there's a huge um, discussion about the protein producers, the, the beef producers, the chicken producers, the impact that they have on the environment. 
Uh, and some of it is related to the fact that some of these pastures have gone into the northern part of Brazil, into the Amazon region. Uh, but some of it is also on social practices and, and, and legal uh, uh, lawsuits for, 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 for work practices. So that's our job as investors to actually do that homework. At BTG, we just launched a new ETF, uh, our first ETF, but it's an ESG-based ETF. We worked with S&P to come up with a new index in Brazil, uh, which we thought would be inclusive and would encourage companies to become better uh, ESG, uh, have better ESG practices. Uh, and it was launched two weeks ago. So we, we definitely believe that there's there's going to be a lot of room for the for that type of uh, product to grow. There's over $100 billion invested in the U.S. in ESG-related ETFs. So we think that that's definitely there. Uh, it's something that's going to continue to grow. So you made you made a good question. You, you made a good point. I think you know, the example you gave of the Mexican CEO talking about his company and then decisions he making when it came to governance. You know, we have a question from Hunter here about how big of a part should ESG values play when making an investment decision. You talked about not divesting completely from a sector. Can you quantify when you're making a decision about how much ESG plays role it plays in really your decision making? Is that possible? So there are companies who are not investable for us because of um, poor governance, where we know that the shareholders, where the controlling shareholders, not going to treat us fairly. Uh, and if there ever comes to it, uh, the controlling shareholder would do what's right for th them and not for for all shareholders. Um, there were there were periods where we didn't invest in Petrobras, for example, in Brazil because of all the corruption that was going on there. Um, they almost broke the company. If it wasn't a state-owned company, the company probably would have uh, gone into Chapter 11 and then have to be restructured. Um, so this was in 2008, the biggest company in Latin America. By 2011, uh, and, and uh, it had fallen. To give an example, it was 18% of the benchmark, Latin America benchmark, at the end of 07, yeah. early 08, when they found this pre-salt oil, and this deep oil in, in the ocean. Uh, and by 2015, it was 3.5% of the benchmark. Huge value destruction uh, for everything that was going on there. Um, you know, Vale, uh, the, the big iron ore producer, has been hurt very much into valuation. And then uh, we, because of the issues that they had with a couple of dams uh, breaking down, and the first time, a big environmental impact, the second time, a big social impact by the, the, the number of people that got killed. So these things definitely come into to play. Um, and I think the big problem that investors have is that there's not a standard to, okay, say, a ESG score of X, Y, or Z is good or it's bad. Every rating agency looks at different things. Uh, there's several rating agencies trying to, to corner that market and become the rating agency from an ESG perspective. Uh, so I think all of us are still trying to figure out how to uh, exactly, how much should ESG be uh, a part of our investment process. It's definitely a part of our investment process. Um, if I wasn't here speaking with you, I would have been on a call with our consultant that's helping us to develop those processes at BTG. Um, but I think it has to be a tool and not a black or white decision maker. Because otherwise, so I think really, really interesting part too. You know, really interesting that that's really the cutting edge of investing is trying to figure out that framework. How do you, how do you, what's the decision process? What can you use when it comes, is one area. I mean, you talked about a few. I mean, you really hinted at a few, which comes, which brings me to my last question, which is really about skill development. But, and before I get to that, I, I want to just highlight that you talked about this. You talked about understanding how do we use algorithms or AI to do some initial screening for us? How do we figure that out? Um, ESG, mm -hmm. understanding frameworks for making investment decisions around ESG. So my final question, this is a question we ask all of our guests on this series is, you know, our students are really in the early stages of their academic journey. As they're wrapping up, um, they're in high school, which means they're coming to the end of their secondary education, thinking about post-secondary decisions. As you reflect back on your time at Georgetown, you talked about political science a little bit, what other skills do you wish you had a chance to learn or to think about it slightly differently when you hire somebody, when you're out there interviewing someone to hire to put on your team, what skills or qualities do you look for them to have? I think communication skills are super important. Uh, I took a public speaking course at Georgetown and after the first week I moved it to pass fail because I was not gonna get an A, I wasn't gonna get a B either at that time. Uh, so I think having that, that skill, having that comfort to speak in public uh, even in this world where it's all more uh, uh, electronic now, I think it's super important because you can have all the best ideas in the world. If you can't communicate them, uh, you're not going to be a good investor. You're not going to be a good analyst on the team because the portfolio manager is not going to listen to you if, you if you can't sell them that idea. So I think that's definitely something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, never stop learning. I mean, we always say that, right, Ben? And these kids are still in high school. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I mentioned to you, but I was thinking about this. 
Um, when I've, I've done some alumni interviews for, for Georgetown uh, over the years, uh, and a lot of times meeting folks like the ones listening to us here, uh, I got confused whether they were applying to Georgetown or applying to BlackRock or to BTG, but they're so <laughs> far ahead, much farther ahead than I was uh, yeah. at this point uh, in my life. So there's a lot of information out there. Uh, so take advantage of it, but also don't forget to live a little bit. Uh, you know, you're gonna, there's going to be a time and place for, for to get really serious. And, uh, you know, in my first job at Bear Stearns, I was working 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day, sometimes six and a half days a week. I don't recommend that either, and I don't think they do that anymore. I think it's only 17 hours a day now, uh, <laughs> but um, and you get Sundays off. Uh, but there'll be time for that. So you know, enjoy in, enjoy the you know if you're seniors, enjoy your senior in high school, even in this crazy period of uh, of COVID. Enjoy the college years. Uh, you know, yeah, get the experience, do all that. Uh, but but also sit, sit back and enjoy a little bit because it is a great time of the of your life. Excellent. Great advice, Will. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciated the conversation. Learned so much from you. I think our students will appreciate it as well. I'm sure they'll put in comments um, any further thoughts they have for you to share, and we can pass those on to you afterwards. I want to remind everybody that the series continues next week. On Wednesday, October 28th, we'll be joined by Sid, who is a captain of the 2018 Global Champions of this very competition. It's a chance for you as students, competitors, to ask questions just before your mid-project review reports are due early in November. Um, a chance to ask him very specific questions on how he found victory in a global competition. Um, so please register for that and tune in. I also want to tease for you a new um, addition that we're adding to our list of programming that will be coming down, and we'll send out an email to you in the coming days, a brand new opportunity to talk to a Wharton faculty member about exciting opportunities and learn even more details as you prepare those final reports um, moving into November and early December. So thank you again, Will Landers, for joining us from BTG Pactual. Also, again, a huge thank you to BTG Pactual for its support of the investment competition and making these conversations like this happen. Um, it was great to talk to you today, and uh, we hope we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thanks. It was great, great being here with you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.